In this section we want to look at how we manage the particular classifications of shock. But before we do that, I want to look at some general management principles that apply to most patients most of the time in most cases of shock. And the first one we notice here is this idea of the golden hour. Now this is an hour of golden opportunity to treat your patients. And of course it's the first hour of the shock state. So we need to instigate treatments ASAP, as soon as possible. Certainly within one hour. If patients are not well treated in the very early stages, certainly within the first hour, their prognosis starts to go down really very rapidly. Obviously we need to maintain a clear airway, ensure adequate ventilation, keep oxygen saturations over 95% if possible. Of course it might not always be possible but this is what we're aiming for. And we need adequate intravenous access. This normally means two peripheral large bore cannulas, maybe one in each arm, to give intravenous drugs and intravenous fluids as they're required. We want two cannulas because if one fails, the patient's life actually depends on having the other cannula available. And as the shock develops, as well as an arterial peripheral vasoconstriction, there's a peripheral venoconstriction as well. So if you don't get cannulas in at an early stage, you may never get them in at all. So get two large cannulas into these patients at an early stage. Adequate intravenous access. Continuous cardiac monitoring will tell us what the heart rhythm is doing in case the patient goes in, into any dysrhythmias, any abnormal heart rhythms. Urinary catheters will normally be installed so we can do hourly volumes of urine so we can get an idea of how well the kidneys are being perfused. Because we want to guard against the patient becoming oliguric or anuric. And as well as that, if the kidneys are hypoperfused for a period of time, the patient can develop an ATN, acute tubular necrosis, renal injury, as a result of hypoperfusion. This is all tied in with fluid balance, which needs to be very accurately recorded. We need to know what's going into the patient and what is coming out of the patient. Central venous monitoring and a central venous line, if available, is useful. That tells us about the preload. It tells us about the amount of blood going back to the heart and it helps us to titrate the amount of intravenous fluids that we give. The patient needs to be nursed in a physiologically desirable position. Normally this will be fairly flat so that the blood is not going uphill to the brain, so that the brain is being well perfused depending on the respiratory status. So you need to use your common sense a bit, but probably the patient's going to be nursed in a reasonably flat position. We need to maintain optimum temperature. We don't want these patients to become hypothermic, especially if the patient is bleeding, because a hypothermic patient, the blood will not clot properly. We need to maintain an adequate normal body temperature. Blood gases can be useful. They will tell us if there's a low PO2, a low partial pressure of oxygen. Very important to know if the patient is becoming hypoxemic. And tied in with blood gases, we can test acid-base balance. And what we're looking for here is the development of an acidosis. The acidosis can tell us about the progression of the shock. So if the acidosis is getting worse, more tissues are being hypoperfused. So keeping an eye on blood pH, on the degree of lactic acidosis, can tell us about the evolution of the condition. Psychological and family support, of course, goes on all the time throughout this entire process. We need to be observing the response of the patient to treatment. No point giving treatment and hoping for the best. Treatment needs to be titrated to individual patient responses. Inotropes and vasoconstricting drugs may be necessary. An inotrope is a drug which increases the force of cardiac contraction and a vasoconstricting drug will cause peripheral vasoconstriction. And if you increase the force of cardiac contraction, 
or you cause peripheral vasoconstriction. Both of those things are going to lead to an increase or a maintaining of blood pressure. And then we need to treat the specific underlying disorder. So what I want to do next in this section is look at the specific classifications of shock and think about how we're going to treat them.